Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I am Michael Mitchell, Project Manager for the Coalition of Rainforest Nations. This is now our third session of our webinar series of six, building up to COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. Today, we will discuss the long journey to the Paris Agreement, what tools, principles, and milestones brought us to this historic international agreement. <clears throat> if you have questions during this interview, please use the raise hand option at the bottom of your screen or add questions in the chat. and We will address those at the appropriate time. Please be advised this will be recorded for future training purposes. <clears throat> when we started designing the webinar series, we were mainly driven by two major events. The IPCC released the first piece of the sixth assessment report, which was due by 2022, and COP26, of course, in Glasgow, which is happening in a few weeks. Based on this, we thought it would be nice to have a conversation between policy and science on climate change. How do these two important elements interact with one another to address the climate emergency? We felt it was a nice connection, and it is important to explain how science and policy work, how the IPCC works, how decisions are made, and how the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement function. This is often forgotten, unknown, and not necessarily clear, even by the players on the field. Today, we have our CFRN Senior Policy Advisor and also Associate Professor of International Environmental Law at the Catholic University of Lille to launch the first webinar of this series focused on policy, Leonardo Masai. Leo, thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here, although still virtual. <laughs> so, Leo, to start this conversation on where climate policy meets science, let's go back to where it all began within the international community. Yeah, sure, Michael. I'm just thrilled to begin this short journey together. So, the first policy instrument that has been adopted by the international community uh, on climate change is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that's clearly linked to the introduction to the IPCC that was provided by my colleague Thelma in the previous webinars. Um, typically, in international environmental law, the boost and incentive to the creation of an international environmental treaty is scientific evidence. Uh, sometimes it can be also a big environmental accident. Uh, for example, just to mention the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident or the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, international environmental law is profoundly shaped also by disasters. Uh, in the case of climate change, it became evident in 1988 when the IPCC published the first report addressing the issue of covering greenhouse gas emissions. This was the basis of the international community to decide to act and begin developing the architecture of the international climate regime. Uh, let's remember that we are in the early 90s and climate change is among the first so-called global common problems, global phenomenon, which are affecting the entire planet. That is uh, different from traditional transboundary pollution that had shaped international environmental law until that time. And at this time, during the initial IPCC report on climate, was the human influence factor also addressed? Uh, yes, sure. The link between uh, human influence and the emissions of greenhouse gases was clearly signaled by the first IPCC report. That link that is even more evident today, which was also explained in the previous webinar uh, when Telma spoke of the connection based on the scientific data. Uh, the contribution of human activities so-called anthropogenic activities is therefore crucial and key to empower the international community to activate itself on addressing the problem. Without that, policymakers lack the ammunition to fight. And so it progressed, and the first piece of the inter existing international climate regime was the adoption of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that would eventually be followed by the Kyoto Protocol a few years later and today by the Paris Agreement which will be the main subject of the fourth webinar of this series uh, next week, uh, Friday. So please be sure to join us next week if you would like to learn more on that. Now let's get into the UNFCCC. What is it and how, it, how does it function? All right, yeah, the UNFCCC is the first internationally legally binding instrument adopted by the international community to fight climate change back in 1994. And it's clearly a key milestone in the fight against climate change. We will also see the other milestones in our journey together. The convention is a framework treaty which identifies principles and objectives of the climate change regime. That includes a general objective under its article two, which notably aims at the stabilization of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere to a level that is not dangerous. 
the convention also established uh, differentiated commitments for the parties and creates an institutional structure which is still in place today, also under the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Um, here you can see a visual of that institutional structure, which may look uh, quite cumbersome and complex. Uh, it is in some sense, but also gives an indication of uh, the work uh, and, the, and the structure that we have now in the, in the climate regime. So a lot of bodies that are working together to make sure that uh, we are going to live in a more decent planet in the future. So when you say differentiated commitments for the parties, who are the parties? Is this each member country of the UN? Well, parties are nations or states recognized by the United Nations that, that, that have decided to be bound by it, normally through a ratification process. And what would you say is one of the most important elements of the convention? Well, clearly uh, a very important element of the convention uh, is the codification of key principles of international environmental law. Uh, the most important in the fight against climate change being the principle of CBDR, common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, that principle basically says that all parties are responsible for climate change, but responsibility has to be distributed across the different actors, based on what? Based on economic development, political considerations, and also many other factors. So this means there are different expectations or requirements for developed versus developing countries. Uh, yes, Michael, and we are touching here a very tricky point. Uh, that is the old point and one aspect that still today drives uh, everyone crazy. Uh, on the basis of this principle, the convention divided the world into two blocks. One block, so-called annex one parties, including all developed countries, and the other block, including all countries which are not in the annex one list, and they are so-called uh, developing countries. And if this principle was set back in the 90s, are there countries that have changed status from develop or from developing to develop since then? Well, the answer to this question, Michael, is yes and no. Or as I normally, normally put it before my student, it's complicated. Uh, many uh, questions in this uh, area get these answers. It's complicated. Yes, the division, that division and that list, the annex one list, is probably today not responding to the current reality uh, in many senses. And are there intentions to ever update the list? Well, today the situation is completely different, uh, but the list has never been touched and it will never be touched, especially now that we live under the Paris Agreement world. Today's reality see, sees, for example, major emitters, so-called major emitters such as China, India, Brazil and South Africa that are excluded from the list. Uh, clearly, even respecting the so-called right to develop and the principle of equity and CBDR, there is an obvious difference between China and Papua New Guinea, or, for example, Brazil and Madagascar. However, this distinction of the world into developed and developing countries was the original start of the international climate regime. Others say it's the original scene, and is still a major component of it. And it seems like this could potentially be viewed as a, as a big problem now. Yes, yes, I believe so. A current system that was supposed to be reformed, uh, we have been trying to reform it, but uh, so far no success. Um, at the institutional level, the convention set an institutional arrangement that applies to the whole climate regime, and that is based on the conference of the parties, uh, whose 26th meeting will happen soon in Glasgow, in Scotland. The COP, the conference of the parties, is the supreme body of the convention and is responsible for its implementation. Together with the COP, every year there is also a meeting of the CMP and the CMA, uh, Conference of the Parties, serving as the meeting of the parties to the agreement, both the equivalent of the COP uh, for the KP and the Paris Agreement respectively. So CMP for the Kyoto Protocol and CMA for the Paris Agreement. Uh, therefore, a COP26, COP16 and CMA3 all together in Glasgow starting Sunday, the 31st of October 2021. Uh, for those uh, attending today that aren't familiar with the COP, how often does this take place? Well, the COP is meeting every year with the exception of 2020 uh, because of the pandemic. So every year at the end of the year. And it is, it's always around the same time in the same location? Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, basically meeting at the end of the year in a different place of the world based on the regional distribution of the United States, uh, the United Nations, sorry. So we have... Uh, 
This year we are going to be in Scotland, Western Europe. Next year we will be uh, in Africa, most likely in Egypt. Uh, so every year we change the location. <clears throat> and are there any other bodies supporting the COP? Uh, yes, of course. The COP is supported by other bodies, in particular the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, the SUBSTA, and the subsidiary body for implementation, the SBI. Those are the two permanent bodies established by the text of the convention, uh, but sometimes subsidiary bodies can be also temporary uh, and established for a specific purpose. For example, uh, the APA, the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Paris Agreement, that was recently established just to design the rule of the Paris, uh, of the Paris Agreement. So <clears throat> I want to get into how the COP works, but before that, let's do a quick poll with the audience on how many delegates do we think currently take part in these events? I found this quite interesting. So how many delegates have participated each year in the prior two COP summits? 1,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 20,000, or 20,000 plus? So here's the next slide. So the answer to that in the past two COPs, we were looking at plus 20,000 for each, and I thought this was really interesting to see. Leo, what do you think about these spikes that we see in the attendance? Yes, Michael, that, that is a very interesting slide, and here we can see the number of delegates attending the COP, which is uh, increasing from the from the first COP in 1994. The first uh, peak, the first spike we have uh, is uh, nine, 2009 COP15 in uh, in Copenhagen, and uh, I'm sure many people also listen to this webinar may remember Copenhagen, and uh, not only because of the cold outside and queuing outside before entering the venue, but also for for the important meeting that we had. Uh, in Copenhagen. We are going to say a few words of, uh, about that later. Um, so clearly that was the first spike, a lot of attendance. Uh, Copenhagen was a very important climate summit and a lot of attention from the media. So as we can see, more than 25,000 delegates attending. Uh, after Copenhagen, there was a kind of uh, uh, drop down of the number, uh, also a bit of frustration about the process. And then the number uh, rise, rise again with another peak in Paris when the Paris Agreement was uh, finally agreed and then following that Marrakesh COP22. So this indicates that these meetings are very well attended. Uh, we have had uh, very big peaks, but also in the other sessions uh, we have at least uh, uh, more than 10,000 delegates. That makes uh, the event uh, also very important from many point of view, but also a lot of expectation uh, in the hands of the, of the presidency, like the, for example this year, COP26 uh, under the presidency of the United Kingdom. So that's a very interesting slide. Michael. Yes. So I let you continue on to how the COP works. Uh, yes, exactly. So getting to that, getting how the, wor the, the COP works, uh, that is also reflected in the work of the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement today. Basically, every single step that we take under this regime, under the convention, is achieved thanks to consensus. Uh, consensus is uh, is very famous uh, in the climate change regime. It's not officially defined by international law. It's an international practice that is applied since the start of the convention in 1994. By consensus, we basically refer to the process to which decisions are taken, which is based on the common understanding and agreement among all parties. All parties, common agreement on the same step to take. And what does the term consensus formally represent as it pertains to the COP? Well, according to consensus, all parties have to be equally satisfied, or as some say, equally dissatisfied. So consensus is not voting, is not uh, uh, unanimity. Uh, there's no voting uh, under, under the process, although this is formally also foreseen in the text of the convention. Consensus is just a process to bring everyone on the same page. That is based on compromise, on a compromise agreement by all parties, and that is the rule. Uh, and that is why it's taking so long also to achieve any, every single step. For example, 10 years of negotiation for concluding the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have been trying to reform the process again, but without success so far. And have there ever been exceptions to this compromise agreement? Uh, yes, Michael, there have been. Um, in the history of the climate negotiation, we have seen some exceptions to this uh, process and concept. Some may remember, and for those that don't, Bolivia expressly objecting the adoption of the Cancun Agreement just one year after Copenhagen uh, in Cancun in 2016. 
Uh, also, for example, uh, how can we forget the Russian Federation, which became very upset uh, at COP18 in Doha when a decision about the future commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol was taken against the interests of the Russians. Despite these exceptions overall, the principle of consensus has been applied so far since COP1 and has paid off. Without consensus, we would not have the Paris Agreement today, and we would not have this overwhelming recognition and support to the new regime that we have now. So now let's get into who are the actors involved in these climate negotiations? Uh, all right, when we talk about the actors of the international climate regime and international relations, we refer to the same actors recognized in international environmental law. The main key actors are, of course, states or governments that are those entities with obligations and rights in international law. Other actors are international organizations uh, or institutions and the civil society. Civil society, of course, play a very important role in the climate negotiation, um, but mostly as observers. In the case of international environmental law, determined by multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Convention, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, we talk about states. States together with one only one regional economic integration organization, which is the European Union. The EU is the only regional organization acting like a state in international environmental law, which is assuming the right uh, and obligations like a state. For example, the EU has presented just one NDC under the Paris Agreement that is covering all its member states. Or under the Kyoto Protocol, the EU has a single reduction target that was then distributed internally across the member states. In the climate regime and the climate negotiations, often states get together in negotiating groups, which are based on geographical distribution in some cases, and in others simply centered around topics of common interest. Those groups represent the states and the interest of all the members. Uh, are there any groups that are considered difficult or controversial? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, the most controversial group in climate negotiation is the group of developing countries for many reasons. And that group is called G77 in China. The members are today much more than 77, but that was the name given to the group when it was created. G77 in China is the biggest group uh, and the most controversial. It's subdivided into smaller groups, such as the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, uh, the group of least developed countries, LDCs, the African group of negotiators, AGN, covering Africa, the BASIC, which is a group covering Brazil, South Africa, India and China, uh, the Arab group, ILAC, Latin America and the Caribbean, ALBA, again, Latin America, CFRN, which is a group that was established exclusively for the purpose of supporting the fight against deforestation uh, and forest degradation. And in the slide, which is on the screen, you can see uh, all the different groups which are very much interconnected to each other. So there are countries that are members of different groups at the same time. And it is also part of the controversies, the controversies of so different interests that, interest that they have to be protected and defended by the groups uh, against each other. Right, so like just for instance, where, do you, where would you see the controversy with some of these? Yeah, yeah, Michael, uh, do, do you think, for example, that uh, Tuvalu has something to share with Saudi Arabia and both? are members of G77? Or, for example, do you think South Africa can defend the interest of uh, a small island like Fiji? And again, both are G77 members. Those are just some extremes, of course, but differences inside G77 and all the subdivisions of countries in G77 are countless. Um, we also have a newly established group formed just before Paris, which is called the Group of LMDCs, like-minded developing countries. So to sum up, there are several groups in the area of developing countries. While in the area of developed countries, we recognized uh, the umbrella group, including the US, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, and similar countries. The EU, of course, the European Union with 27 member states. And finally, the environmental integrity group, which is including Switzerland, Mexico, South Korea, South Korea and other countries. Uh, alone remain just a few countries, including two big countries like uh, the UK, United Kingdom and, and Turkey. And uh, what would be the purpose for countries to get included in these groups? Uh, yeah, sure. There are many purposes. So countries get into one group to be better represented and to better achieve their interest in the negotiations. Together is better than alone. 
your voice is better heard, your face is more easily recognized. Together, countries can have their voices louder and they can be recognized, they can be seen. Uh, often countries get together also to receive the needed support, especially developing countries for whom it's important to be in a group. Since the group is representing the countries, is helping with the logistics, uh, coordination, establishing common positions, summarizing the talks, facilitating compromise, so many, many reasons. Uh, negotiations are conducted through groups. Otherwise, would you imagine 200 governments in the same room to agree on common language all the time? That would be impossible. Um, keep in mind that when we are talking about climate negotiations, we are mainly referring to the negotiations that have brought us towards uh, what we have today as the Paris Agreement. So what specifically has, since the convention was established, led us to the Paris Agreement? Uh, well, as I mentioned, the convention is dated back to 1994, and after three years, parties decided that, that it alone it was not enough to deal with climate change. This led to establishing the Kyoto Protocol, which is a legally binding international treaty, independent from the convention, but also attached to it. And independent, but also attached. What exactly does that mean? Uh, yes, exactly. So the Kyoto Protocol is related to the convention. It addresses the same topic. It is based on the same institutional arrangements. Uh, today, the Kyoto Protocol is still alive, but as I always say, is rather weak, uh, actually sick, since ratification of the second commitment period did not receive too much support. Uh, today, there is a limited number of countries, developed countries, that have joined Kyoto Protocol phase two, and this makes it very weak at the moment, but still in force though. The Kyoto Protocol is a very innovative and an advanced, an advanced treaty in international environmental law, but unfortunately that hasn't really paid off due to the minimal effect it has had on the atmosphere since its implementation. The Kyoto Protocol will be remembered, among its others, because it did establish legally be binding reduction commitments, legally binding targets, only for developed countries. Developing countries did not get any obligation and, and commitment under the protocol, and that's why they love it so much. The Kyoto Protocol target have been established through a top-down approach, namely they have been fixed at the international level by the COP and as such imposed internationally on countries through percentages of reduction of tons of CO2 equivalent. Please let's keep this in mind when we're going to discuss about the Paris Agreement that has adopted a completely opposite approach than the Kyoto Protocol. So, and what would you say are some of the key features from the Kyoto Protocol? Well, I always mention three major features of the Kyoto Protocol meriting attention. Those elements make the Kyoto Protocol very exceptional, very advanced, and very much loved uh, also by international lawyers. The first, the Kyoto Protocol created the compliance regime, which is governed by uh, a so-called compliance committee, and by the enforcement branch, which is a quasi-judicial body. So it works like a tribunal, like a court, although it's formally not a tribunal, it's a quasi-judicial body because it can adopt decisions with consequences for states that are in breach of the Kyoto Protocol. And the Compliance Committee is still very active today, reviewing parties' respect of the Kyoto Protocol obligations, especially for the second commitment period. And just recently, there have been uh, uh, a few countries uh, and scrutiny of the Compliance Committee. And again, let's remember this when discussing the Paris Agreement, because again, this is a very big difference between Kyoto and Paris. Um, the second key element is the recognition of the key role of forest and land use and land use, use activities. We call it yeah, land use, land use change and forestry. So that developed countries have been given the chance to discount their target by making reference to activity in the forestry and agriculture sector thus taking into account the sequestration of carbon by the soil and by the forest. So we are talking about things like afforestation and reforestation, forest management, revegetation or cropland management, for example. These opportunities given to countries to meet their targets in a more efficient and flexible manner. And finally, the third and also most important element of the Kyoto Protocol is the, is the the flexible mechanism and the establishment of the international carbon market. And now what are these flexible mechanisms? 
Uh, yeah, Michael, the, the Kyoto Protocol created three flexible mechanisms that uh, built, were built upon the market-based approach. Uh, the first is emissions trading, which is based on the exchange of reduction units among states, among parties. And the second set of instruments, including two mechanisms, is the project-based mechanism, such as uh, Clean Development Mechanism, CDM, and Joint Implementation, JEI where basically developed countries were given the possibility to invest in developing countries through transfer of technology, transfer of funds, uh, promotion of sustainable development, uh, in particular in projects that were reducing greenhouse gas emissions in a manner that is cheaper than domestically. So reducing greenhouse gas emission is uh, economically more viable in Argentina, for example, than, than in Italy. This is just an example. So the carbon market mechanism were established to, be, to give a possibility to develop countries to reduce their emissions uh, at a cheaper cost. Okay, so now what events came after the Kyoto Protocol? Well, first of all, it should be remembered that the Kyoto Protocol was agreed in 1997 and it took us eight years for the Kyoto Protocol to enter into force. And let's keep this in mind again when talking about Paris. Eight years for the Kyoto Protocol to enter into force, eight months for the Paris Agreement. That's a big difference. Um, and this already gives you an indication of the complexity of this treaty and on the effects that it may have on the economies of state. That is, for example, one of the reasons it was never ratified by the U.S. administration. Uh, to your question, Michael, when the Kyoto Protocol came into force in 2005, parties decided to launch the negotiation for the new international regime. And there was, since the beginning, a two streams negotiations. First, a negotiation of all the details of the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol as of 2012. And second, uh, a parallel negotiations on the future of the convention. And this is indicated in the, in the slides on the screen. Now, why two streams? Well, basically, the first one is where developed countries have obligations, the Kyoto Protocol stream. And the second one, the convention stream, is where all parties are present. Soon it became evident that many parties forgot the protocol style and focused on the convention where all parties are, are there, are present. Um, negotiations for the new climate regime were launched in 2005, and two years later in Bali, COP13 adopted the Bali Action Plan, which sets the time frame and the time plan for the new international treaty. Two years of multilateral talks to conclude in Copenhagen. That was the, the, the deal and the, and, the, and the deadline which was set by the Bali Action Plan. The Bali Action Plan is another key milestone um, when we talk about the climate change regime. So the Bali Action Plan identifies five areas of negotiation that are still today the main areas and the main pillars of the Paris Agre uh, Agreement. Uh, those are uh, shown also in the screen. The first one is the shared vision for the long-term cooperative action, including a long-term global goal for emissions reduction. That is the global goal the global objective that the international community is giving to ourselves, to itself, uh, to fight against climate change. The second pillar is mitigation. And mitigation is also including several elements like uh, the role of developing countries, the role of developed countries, the role of carbon markets, forestry, red plus, and many others. Adaptation, which is now also associated to loss and damage as well. Finance, the importance of climate finance, and finally, technology transfer and capacity building. So negotiations in Copenhagen represented the focus of the international diplomacy back in 2009. And for the first, and I would say the last time, all, all almost all major heads of state and government attended the COP. Uh, unfortunately, Copenhagen turned out to be a failure diplomatically in premise. And the prime minister of Denmark chairing the COP had serious difficulties to manage the meeting and actually left the final plenary um, before the end. So COP15 in Copenhagen 2009 did not agree to accept the Copenhagen Accord that was negotiated by political leaders, including uh, the president of the United States at that time, Obama, the night before. So uh, an agreement that was negotiated by political leaders. So, uh, and what was agreed upon in COP15? Well, at the end, COP15 final plenary uh, that lasted 13 hours, uh, there was no agreement that was reached during that meeting because of the lack of consensus. 
So uh, Tuvalu first, country, small island state, Venezuela, and many other countries following rejected the text of the Copenhagen Accord that was not formally adopted by COP15. So after so many hours of negotiations, 13 hours, the COP decided to take note of the Copenhagen Accord. So the language used by the COP is taking note. So a neutral language, no formal approval. However, the Copenhagen Accord, thanks to this language, indirectly entered the UNFCCC system uh, by being published on the website and countries were given the possibility to associate themselves with the accord afterwards. And that was uh, exactly what the majority of the countries in the world did after Copenhagen. So uh, amongst others, the Copenhagen Accord was not adopted because of procedural mistakes by the COP presidency, but also because of the lack of political engagement and the lack of cooperation by key players, including a big players like China, for example. Um, however, the Copenhagen Accord is imp an important milestone as well. It remains the political backbone, the skeleton of the current climate change regime shaped by the Paris Agreement today. The Copenhagen Accord is a declaration type agreement, very short, only three pages, and the only two numbers that are included there are first, the two degrees as the limit in the augmentation of the temperature by 2100 a number which is also very famous today in the Paris Agreement reality. Second number, also relevant today, is the US dollars under billion commitment of climate finance every year by developed countries. Both numbers uh, widely disregarded so far, unfortunately. So COP16 in Cancun, the year after Copenhagen, continued the work left in Copenhagen and basically translated the Copenhagen Accord language into decision text. So in the very important decision taken in Cancun, so-called Cancun Agreement. In 2017, in Durban, parties agreed to another key terminology, which is now a critical part of the Paris Agreement vocabulary. That is the term applicable to all parties that some welcome with a lot of joy as the solution for the issue of differentiation. Some others basically did not give it too much emphasis. So in Durban, it was decided that uh, the new agreement, the new regime should be applicable to all parties. The Durban outcome also indicated 2015 as the new deadline for the new regime. And that is exactly when the Paris Agreement was agreed after so many hours and months of negotiation. Uh, but Michael, this is a story that will be continued uh, next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. So that brings us to the Paris Agreement, which we will be discussed this coming Friday. Before we close out, I'd like to open up the chat for anyone that would like to have any questions for Leo. So we have one coming in say, how do you appreciate the influence of climate activism, like what is done by Greta Thunberg, on decisions in COP and the duration of the process to arrive on a consensus? Uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. That's a very interesting question. Uh, um, the the role of acti activism and NGOs is very important, and in general, observers. As I mentioned at the beginning, the civil society and observers play a key role in climate negotiation, although formally they are not part of the negotiation. So usually negotiations among states uh, are conducted behind closed doors, although the tendency is today to open as much as possible those doors. But at the end of the day, the real negotiation, the last hours of negotiation are behind closed doors. So the role of activism is still very important, though uh, NGOs can influence the position of states internally, but also at the meetings. NGOs, the civil society can provide inputs to the, to the process by submitting views and reports that are considered by, uh, by the parties. And least, lastly, also, of course, the role of um, big activists like, for example, Greta Thunberg is also important just to, to bring uh, more attention to the issue and to, to, to bring the message across. So I think it's a very important role that indirectly is influencing uh, what parties are deciding in those rooms. Absolutely. And we have another question that comes in that says, uh, on the delegations groups in your experience in climate negotiations, what would you say are the most successful or powerful countries in this domain? Uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. That's also a very interesting and delicate question. So, as I mentioned during the, the presentation, uh, negotiate the, the, the developing countries, especially in delegations, are usually uh, together in groups. Uh, groups are 
there to help, especially developing countries delegation that are uh, uh, they have uh, less people in the negotiation and they also have less capacity. So that's very important, the existence of groups. So groups are very important. There are groups which are very active. I would mention, for example, ILAC, which is a very, uh, very active group and which is very well organized, uh, LDCs, EOSIS. There are groups, of course, like the CFRN, which is also very strong and very active on issues around forest. When um, we talk about countries and delegations, of course, there we have big delegations, big countries that have a lot of power and a lot of capacity. I would say in terms of diplomacy, clearly the Brazilians are, are a very good delegation and very powerful. We have China, of course, which is uh, probably also less loudly, but uh, um, uh, also very important in terms of uh, developed countries. We also have um, the big machine of the European Union, which is very well organized. Uh, and a lot of competence. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, many other countries, as I said, uh, usually the, the trick and the practice is to get together through groups where your voice is better heard. Uh, but it's a very interesting dynamics and international relations are reflected in how the climate negotiations are structured. Great. Well, thanks again, Leo. I definitely learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. Uh, that's all the time we have. If anyone has any more questions, please reach out to our contacts here. We'll be happy to help, and we will see you next week. Thank you very much, Leo. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.